Hi there, I'm Massa. I'm a PhD candidate at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. And I'm very excited to share our very recent research uh, entitled Trading on Chain, How Feasible is Regulators Worst Case Scenario with you at the DeFi Workshop. And uh, this is a joint work with my supervisor, Jeremy Clark. Uh, before jumping into the work itself, I want to take some time and talk about the motivation and the reason why we did this research. So we are at a DeFi workshop and I'm pretty sure that uh, you crypto enthusiasts, uh, you all sort of know about familiar crypto exchanges and in general what crypto exchanges are. Uh, but here I want to provide some sort of like very simple evaluation framework between three main categories of crypto exchanges. So the first one is a centralized exchange, which uh, in this category, the, the exchange operator would provide a centralized trading platform that the traders would use and they have to rely on for trading. So this category is very easy to use. It's not very hard. And because it's not on the blockchain, it is very fast and it is almost instant. And from regulators perspective, uh, this group is very easy to regulate because if something happens, there would be some centralized entities that regulators and governments, they can perform investigations on. And a centralized exchange, it is very easy to realize and implement. But because you're relying on an exchange operator, it is not really secure. And we have seen a lot of hacks and frauds in the past in centralized crypto exchanges. The example is Megox. And we all know that. I don't want to take, take any time on that. The second category is a DEX, a decentralized exchange. And despite the name decentralized, this group is not fully on chain. So what happens is some, some functionalities, like including loading the accounts or order cancellations are being done on a blockchain, whereas some other functionalities, including matching the orders are being done off chain. So usability is the same, it's great. And uh, from regulators perspective, a DEX is not any different from a centralized exchange because there can still be investigations on those entities. And a DEX is not hard to implement. But because some, some things are being done on the blockchain, performance is an issue. And uh, on the other hand, because some functionality is, on, is off chain, uh, we have some security issues here. So the third category I want to talk about is a fully on chain exchange. So here, everything is on chain. So they basically use an on chain order book that provides uh, trading between peers on a blockchain. So from usability perspective, this group is great. And from security, again, it is perfect because nothing is done off the blockchain. But because we are doing everything on chain and we know that blockchains are slow, performance is a bottleneck. And also from regulations, this group is the worst because if something happens within the exchange, there would be no entities that regulators can go after and perform investigations on. And because of some issues that I'm going to talk about in these presentations, a fully on-chain exchange is not really easy to implement. So why we did this research? Uh, it was a while ago that the Quebec regulator, Autorité des Marchés Financiers, they reached us and they basically asked this question that is it really feasible to have a fully on-chain exchange service on a public blockchain like Ethereum today. And the reason they're asking this question is that fortunately for regulators, nowadays most of the cryptos are being traded off-chain, like on a centralized exchange or a DEX. But if we happen to have a fully on-chain exchange, that would be the worst case for them, right? So they can't really control it. So they want to know if it is feasible or not. So we started this research and we asked ourselves three main research questions. The first one is we wanted to know if secure trading, uh, I mean, resistant to front running and price manipulation really feasible on a public blockchain like Ethereum. And if it is possible like to have such a service, what would be the performance benchmark? 
And also we have seen some novel techniques like layer two solutions nowadays. So we wanted to know what would be the impact of those layer two solutions on the performance of such a system. All right, so before we do this uh, work, we actually went out and we did a lot of research to see if there's any on-chain exchange out there that is operating fully on-chain so that we can understand what they're doing and we could answer these questions. But uh, what we found was a lot of white papers that were, they were all talking about on-chain exchanges and the benefits of it. But until there is an actual implementation, this would be all like an speculation, right? So to avoid any kind of speculations, we had to roll up our sleeves and start experimenting and implementing the technology so that we could answer these questions. All right, now that we know what we want to do, we have to start designing the system, right? So we know that the order book is a ledger. And on the other hand, blockchain technologies give us distributed ledger, right? So the potential design for such a system would be just dumping a price time priority order book on a blockchain, easy peasy, right? But it's not as easy as it sounds, and I'm gonna show you why. So the first issue is when using a price time priority order book, the time priority matters. So if two orders arrive to the order book at the same price, the one that is like it arrives first wins, right? But on a blockchain, there's no wall clock to establish the time and to enforce the time priority. So if Alice is more well connected to the network than Bob is, then what happens is her order executed first, even though she sends it after Bob, right? But uh, so we have this issue of time, but like we can't really do that with order book on a blockchain. The other issue is blockchains are slow. And we know that stock markets move very, very fast. Like in high frequency trading, for example, there are active dealers like computers that they are trading at a nanosecond level. Like sometimes they're even physically co-located with the actual exchange that is connected to the actual exchange computer with the LAN cable. So the shorter the LAN cable is, the faster they can exploit the price difference in the market. And so the speed matters. Whereas in a blockchain, like for example, in Bitcoin, uh, block, like every blocks are created every 10 minutes. So that is very slow. The other issue is we know that blockchains are transparent. So everything is so transparent and public. So we have censorship issue with transactions. So nodes, they can drop competitive orders and they simply just don't propagate the orders to their neighbors. And miners are even in a more powerful positions because they are the ones that decide which transactions are being placed in a, in a block. And also they are the last ones to decide which transactions are included in those blocks. So they're basically controlling how the order books get updated, right? So uh, they can also front run those transactions that they, they, they see that it would harm them if they're executed. So we have this front running issue as well. All right, so because of these issues that I just discussed, we cannot dump like an order book on a public blockchain. So what we should do, there are two options for us. Either we close the network and instead of a public blockchain, we use a private blockchain, like a permission blockchain, where not everybody can be a node and miner, then we can eliminate the censorship and front running issues. And we have centralized time server that would enforce the time priority. Uh, on the other hand, we, we can use some data structure alternative to order work, and we can stick to the public blockchain. What we chose to do in our work was the second option. So we stayed on public blockchain, we chose Ethereum, and we decided to use a call market rather than an order book itself. And the reason why we want to do that is if we can get some system like a fully on-chain exchange to work on Ethereum, which is a very hostile network and environment because we have nodes, we have miners, we have front running, we have censorship, uh, then this system will only work better on a permission blockchain like Hyperledger, for example. That's why we use this option. 
So what is a car market? A car market is basically an auction. So the way it works is uh, the auction sort of opens and bids and asks are submitted, but they're not executed immediately. And they just sit inside the market. And then the auction closes and orders that overlap with each other, they're executed immediately. All right, how does like using a car market would solve those issues that I just discussed? First off, uh, in call market, there's no time priority. Uh, we are batching transactions. So um, orders, they arrive, they're not executed immediately, I just said. So they just sit there, so we're batching them. So it doesn't matter like which order comes first. Either you get into the auction when it's open or you don't. Also, blockchains are slow, we just discussed this. But call markets are slow too. We are accumulating the order like in a seven minute period or so. So that would solve these issues. About the censorship of transaction, we do encourage the nodes to propagate the transactions well enough so that at least one miner would see the transaction and would include that inside their block. And about the front running, first off, call markets inherently combat front running. And why? Because uh, as I just discussed, there's no time priority. So it doesn't matter which order comes first. And also in our design, what we do is we give the price improvements to the miners. So we hope that like by doing so, like they are disincentivized to do the front running because they're already getting the price improvements, right? All right, now that we want, like we know that we want to do a call market on Ethereum, uh, the main design decision here is to choose the ideal data structure to store and hold the data, the, or the orders I mean. And uh, as, as we've been discussing this since the beginning of my talk, performance is a bottleneck for us on Ethereum because we are very limited in terms of gas. So the most expensive step here in call market is closing the market and processing all those transactions because it is being done in a batch, right? So the ideal layer structure for us is a priority queue where each order has a priority and the priority is its price. So we use two priority queues. The first one is uh, for bids, where highest priority element is the one that has highest price. And the other hand is the one for ask, which lowest uh, price ask has the highest priority. All right, so we may, you all, I mean, you may know what is a priority queue, but uh, very briefly, it has three uh, main operations. The first one is in queue function, which just inserts an element inside a priority queue. Uh, the DQ function that removes the highest priority element. And the last one is, is empty function that we call if we, know, if we wanna know if the priority queue is empty or not. So there are many ways to implement a priority queue and each priority queue has an underlying list. It could be static array, dynamic array, or a linked list. So as we just said, keeping the data sorted is the main like, step because it's the most expensive one. So we have to understand which uh, underlying list we want to have. So we can either sort the data during each in queue or sort for each DQ or just we can just split the costs by using the heap. So as I just mentioned, closing the market is being done in a batch, right? So it's the most expensive step. We don't want to do that. So we just skip the second step and we stick with this uh, one and third step. And um, having that in mind, we implemented five priority queues, uh, three variants of heap, like heap with dynamic array, static array, and mapping. And we have two variants of linked list. One of them is the linked list itself. The other one is doubly linked list with mapping. All right, now that we have all these priority queues, we want to know which one has the best performance. Why? Because we want to decide which one is faster to be used for our call market. So what we did was we tried so many tests, performance tests, including testing the call market with each of these priority queues to understand which one has a better performance. So the first test that we did was on an in queue function. So what we did was we insert 50 random integers into each priority queue and we got a gas cost. Gas cost. And here you can see that um, the heap variants, the, the, the three on the bottom, uh, they are the least expensive and they have this logarithmic cost. 
uh, but the Linkly experience are the most expensive in terms of in queue because they have a linear cost. And now that each priority queue is holding 50 integers, we iterate the DQ function until the data structures are totally empty. And uh, in the second column here, you can see the gas cost for dequeuing all those priority queues. And you can see that linked list variants are the best. And because we were interested in refund, we wanted to know how much refund we get by like, clearing out the storage in terms of each priority queue. And also because EVM doesn't stand for gas refund at the moment, I calculated the gas refund manually and we provide them in the third column here. And the fourth column, you see if uh, we get the full refund uh, in terms of each priority queue or not, which all of those priority queues, they give the maximum amount of refund they could in terms of DQ. All right, so based on what we saw uh, in inqueuing, heap variants are the cheapest. And in dequeuing, linked list variants are the cheapest. And I've been telling that uh, like over and over in my talk that dequeuing in a call market is done as a batch. Whereas for in queue, every time a trader submit an order, they would just pay the gas cost and it's just one time. Uh, one time every time they wanna submit the order. So we suggest using a link list because that's what we care. And that's what is being done in a batch. And it, was, it would be very expensive. All right, so we, with that link list, we implemented uh, our call market, which is called Lisi. Uh, so Lisi is written in 324 lines of solidity. Uh, we wanted it to be a simple module so that the developers can modify it as they choose. And the way it works is just a simple call market that I explained to you at the beginning of the talk. Uh, the call market opens and it accepts orders and the upcoming orders, they're stored in a priority queue, not the call market itself. And uh, the call market closes and then the orders that are overlapping, they are uh, executed against each other. All right, so we have eight main operations in the Lisi smart contract itself. Uh, we have deposit token and deposit ether that can be called along with submit bid and submit ask. When traders want to submit their orders, they have to deposit some tokens or ethers depending on what they want to trade. And we have open market that open the market. We have closed market that just closes the market and processes all the orders. And at the end of the settlement, uh, traders can call either of claim tokens or claim ether functions to claim their ethers or tokens back. All right, now that we have the code itself, we wanted to measure how many orders we can process in a single Ethereum transaction when closing the market on Ethereum today. So what we did was we implemented a generic call market with a generic priority queue at its own address. And we run a variety of performance tests to see how many orders call market can handle when using different priority queues. So in the second column here, you can see that the, what, what is the highest number of orders in terms of pairs a call market can handle uh, when calling the close market function when using different priority queues. As, and you can see uh, linked list is doing its best. And uh, the column after shows the gas cost for it. Also, we know that Ethereum is gonna improve like in either close future or far future. Also, we have layer two solutions that are uh, decreasing the cost uh, of execution transaction on Ethereum. So we really was we are curious to know what would be the cost for a thousand pairs of orders. And this column shows the cost for executing thousand pairs of orders in each uh, priority queue case. And the last column shows the gas cost for submitting the order into each priority queue. And because this number really depends on how many orders are already sitting inside a PQ, uh, we average 200 order submissions in each case. All right, now that we can see this like Lisi-esque design is not really fast on Ethereum, we, we were curious to know if we can do any better in terms of performance. And uh, we implemented a variant of Lisi using a layer two solution, which is Arbitrum. 
So uh, using Arbitron, we can really decrease the cost because it really scales up uh, things for us by uh, moving the execution of transactions off the blockchain. So what happens is uh, nothing really changes uh, for users. They, they can still do everything as they were doing before, but things change under the hood. And I want to take some time and explain you how. Uh, so a user would use a front end that is provided by Arbitrum. That's why they don't understand, they don't really realize any difference from their, like in a previous design where they were just calling functions from Ethereum. So here they would just, a user, a trader wants to submit a bid to Listy. What happens is uh, the front end would send, instantiate a transaction to the inbox contract of Arbitrum that is sitting on a blockchain, on the Ethereum blockchain. So this is not a function call. This is just instructing the Arbitrum inbox contract to execute a function call of submitting a bid order for 100 DeFi tokens. On the other side, we have some validators that they're constantly watching the Ethereum blockchain and the Arbitrum inbox contract specifically to see if there's any instruction for calling a function. So they, they, they see that there is an instruction to submit 100 DeFi token to Lissy. So they fetch it from the inbox, they execute the transactions them, they sell themselves, and they would just update the state uh, of Lissy on Arbitrum, block, Arbitrum chain that is running on top of blockchain. And at the end of the day, the state of the, the ARP chain would just get sync with Arbitrum inbox, and Ethereum would just um, verify that the function would have been executed correctly. So everything is execution is being done off chain and we got the state at the end of the day on the chain and that would be perfect. And uh, here uh, you can see the result. And uh, for, for maximum number of trades, each priority queue could handle, uh, we have the gas on Ethereum uh, blockchain. And on the other side, we have the L2 ARP gas for maximum number of trades. So you, you may realize that the numbers are much bigger than Ethereum gas, but I have to emphasize on the fact that ARP gas is much, much, much cheaper than Ethereum gas. So basically we can close infinite number of orders using any number, any of those priority queues, and the cost would be still very, very low. It's not expensive. Just don't, don't be like shocked by these numbers. Also, okay, so the takeaways from my talk is such a design, like a fully on-chain exchange on a public blockchain, it is feasible nowadays, but it's full, only a narrow like set of markets. For example, like low liquidity or limited number of traders. But this technology is likely to improve because Ethereum is gonna improve or uh, we will see more of these layer two solutions that I just uh, explained one of them to you. So we will really have an improvement in such a system. So uh, we should be alert, especially regulators, they should be alert that these systems are feasible. Also, we have some discussion points in, in the paper that they are worth referring to that I cannot really go over because of uh, limitation of the time. Uh, we discuss uh, about like market clearing price. Uh, we talk about scheduling events because uh, in Ethereum functions cannot be executed by themselves. So somebody has to call, close and open the market. Uh, functions and they have to pay the gas cost for it. So we discuss the landscape of options for this. And at the end, we discuss things about collateralization options. All right, thank you so much. You can get in touch with me. If you have any questions or suggestions, uh, you're more than welcome to. You can contact me by my email or uh, using the Twitter and or my website and also this paper is already public on archive if you want to refer to it thank you so much and have a great day